Please join me in thanking Professor Darrell White for that wonderful meeting. Well, good morning and welcome to the Whittier School here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And today is a really special day for us in the University of Nebraska greater community to recognize a person and his legacy and his family who has meant so much to our university over this last decade and a half. It's a very special day to be in Nebraska. I want to start first by uh, welcoming Prim Paul's family who are all here with us today and I'd, uh, you're going to hear from uh, one of the family here later in the ceremony this morning but I want you to meet all of them. Uh, Missy who has been such a great ambassador for the University of Nebraska and UNL. Uh, daughter Nina uh, is here with us from New York. Uh, her husband Steve. Uh, uh, Ryan, son Ryan, who you will hear from later. Steve's not with us, I missed that one. Nina's going, oh, we're, oh he's here in spirit. Um, and granddaughter Ashland is, is trolling around here somewhere with Abby Clutter here. We're so glad to have them. Please join me in welcoming the Paul family. Back to this turnout this morning on a rainy pre-Thanksgiving kind of time of year uh, just pays tribute to the giant that Prim was for us. We all loved him deeply, loved him dearly. Uh, we were reminiscing a little bit here this morning as we led up to the beginning of the ceremony about how when Prim's name was mentioned on campus, especially these last few years, there was an extra round of excitement, an extra round of applause because of everything we knew that he meant to us. He came here in 2001, he came here to energize our campus at a time when many were questioning whether we were where we needed to be as a university. Many of you will remember that time. And Harvey hired and brought Prim to us to lead our research efforts, and he never looked back. He said, how big can we be? How bold can we be? How much can we build? What impact can we have on the world? That's the way Prim thought, believed, worked, and acted in everything that he did for us here as, his, uh, as our Vice Chancellor. We're really pleased to have a, a wide swath of our university community and constituents and stakeholders here with us today. We, we thank you all for being here. I want to first ask President Hank Bounds, our President of the University of Nebraska, to come forward and give greetings on behalf of the university. President Bounds. Thank you. So uh, maybe, maybe I'll just speak to the family. Um, I, I feel uh, a little cheated. I had very limited time to work with Prim. I knew of Prim uh, from afar, but uh, Missy, you, you should know that, so, th so there'll be scientists and Harvey and everyone else that can talk about the work that Prem did. And he is well respected for that work. But Prem, when I was named president, was among the first two or three people to call me. He was among the first people to greet me when I landed during transition. He was among the first uh, folk here at the university to come see me when I started. Uh, he knew that the move for Will and Caroline was not easy. He knew that Will was interested in math and science. And our first conversation always started with, how is Will doing? And so just, it's, you know, his, his, that relationship, you know, one of the reasons that I think that people give a round of applause for Prim and this extra round of applause that Ronnie talked about was, truly because of his scientific expertise, but I think it was more because of who he was as a man. And one of the things that I hope that people say about me when I'm no longer here is he was a good man. And that's what I can say about your father, about your husband. He was a good scientist, but he was a great human being. He was a good man. And I felt honored to have the, the short amount of time that I did with him.
Prim would tell you that he had the opportunity to work with four University of Nebraska presidents, and he was proud of all of them. Dennis Smith, J.B. Milliken, Jim Linder, who I believe is here um, with us this morning as well, and now Hank. And as Hank said, when he came and got the opportunity to know Prim, it wasn't a very long period of time, but he got to know him well. And in the last few weeks of Prim's life, here just a few months ago, we approached President Bounds and the Board of Regents and asked them to consider the opportunity to put Prim's legacy and name on this facility that we're dedicating this morning. And I will tell you that Hank's immediate response was an enthusiastic, absolutely. So Hank, thank you. Bob Whitehouse here from the Board of Regents this morning. Thank you for your support in allowing this to happen. One of the things that Prim was the absolute proudest of beyond his family was faculty. He believed in the faculty of the University of Nebraska. He believed in the impact the faculty of the university have every day and how that could be bigger and bolder and, and better as we move forward. So we have asked two faculty members this morning to come and share some thoughts from their perspective on what Prim's legacy will be enduring here at the university. First, we've asked Dr. Jim Van Etten, the Allington Professor of Plant Pathology in the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources, who has been on, I think, the research council that Prim started since its inception uh, when he came here and helped to advise and guide Prim. Uh, Jim is also one of our members of the National Academy of Sciences, the highest honor that a scientist can have in the United States. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jim Van Etten. Well, thank you. I was given, told I had three minutes to sort of uh, summarize Prim's research career. And uh, as you know, that's gonna be very difficult. But uh, I feel very honored to be asked to do that. Now, many of you probably don't know that professionally, a Prim was a virologist and a very productive person before he came to Nebraska. As far as background goes, uh, he obtained his uh, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine in India and then came to the United States in 1969 to attend graduate school at the University of Minnesota where he obtained his PhD in veterinary microbiology focusing on virology in 1975. Now, most of his PhD research was on viruses that infect turkeys. He then uh, continued at Minnesota for three years as a research associate uh, after he obtained his PhD, and then moved to the U.S. Uh, in 1978, he moved to the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Animal Disease Center at Ames, Iowa, where he focused his attention on swine virus diseases, that is, pig viruses. In 1985, he joined the faculty uh, in veterinary science at Iowa State University, where he continued to work on swine virus diseases. And during this time, he spent a lot of effort studying a new virus disease on swine that arrived in the United States in 1987 called porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus. Uh, most of his efforts were focused on ways to diagnose the disease and to develop vaccines uh, to prevent the disease. Uh, this effort resulted in many publications and 11 patents, most of which were dealing with that particular virus. Prim then started his administrative career in 1993 when he became an associate dean for research and graduate studies at Iowa State while still maintaining an active research program in his lab. In 2000, he became the Associate Vice Provost for Research at Iowa State, and then moved to UNL in 2001 as the Vice Chancellor for Research and Dean of Graduate Studies, where he immediately began to change the research environment at UNL. His title then changed in 2008 when he became the Vice Chancellor for Research and economic development at UNL. As I say, Prim had a very successful career as a virologist. He published 97 research papers in excellent journals, and as near as I can tell, his last publication, research publication, was in the year 2003. 
During his time at Ames, he trained about 30 graduate students and postdocs, as well as hosting 15 visiting scholars. One of the things that Prim was very proud of was that one of his former students, Dr. X.J. Ming, at Virginia Tech University was elected to the National Academy of Sciences last spring, and I know he and Missy were planning on attending uh, his induction ceremony this coming spring. I hope, Missy, you can make it. Uh, Prim was also very active in forming the National Academy of Inventors, and he was a charter member of the first uh, of the society being elected in 2014. Prim did many things while he was at Nebraska to change the research environment. He played a major role in the creation of the number of centers on campus. It was very helpful in obtaining large grants to support their operation, including the Nebraska Center for Virology. Finally, and probably most importantly, Prim was a wonderful colleague, and it was an honor to consider him a personal friend. Prim, we love you, and we miss you very much. Thank you. One of the reasons it's so fitting that the Whittier School will now bear the Prim S. Paul name is that Prim believes so, so diligently in the value of interdisciplinary research and the need for interdisciplinary research. The starting of centers like the Nebraska Center for Virology, the Nebraska Center for Plant Science Innovation, the Transportation Center, the Energy Sciences Research Center, all of which Water for Food, who ended up in this building, many of those centers at one point in their developmental history. Our second faculty member that we've asked to share a few thoughts with us this morning is, is Dr. Susan Sheridan. Sue, if you'd come forward. Sue is a member of our faculty in the College of Education and Human Sciences, a world-renowned expert in the field of early childhood education and development, and the director of what now is one of the largest research centers in the world in the study of research on children, youth, families, and schools. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sue Sheridan. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Um, and thank you very much for being here on behalf of all of the faculty and administration and Prem and his family. Uh, it's, a, it's a true honor for me to be up here in front of you to say a few words about what Prem meant for all of us. There are really so few opportunities in one's career when you can take time out of our busy schedules to reflect on really what matters most in life. So I'm really honored and I'm humbled by the invitation to say a few words about Prem Paul and what he meant to me personally, and I dare say to all of us. For those of you who don't know me, I'm not a virologist, I'm not a veterinarian. I'm a social behavioral scientist. I have committed my career to identifying how to help people mostly children, achieve to their greatest potential. In our center, we work to identify strengths in people and to help them develop and succeed, sometimes in the face of many obstacles and despite the odds. In many ways, this is also what Prem committed his life to. That is helping people by creating the conditions within which they can excel. In our work, we search for strengths. Prem had an uncanny way of identifying talent. We scaffold children's attainment of developmental tasks. He helped us all build upon early successes to leverage greater achievements. We reinforce small and large increments in learning. Prem applauded, in fact celebrated, accomplishments of all size and magnitude. As I said, Prem was not a social scientist. He did not do research with young children and families. He led the research mission of our major flagship research institution at Nebraska. But he seemed to know inherent, inherently and intuitively what it took us decades to prove. That is, relationships matter. Prem cared deeply about every single one of us. He was a champion for UNL and for research. Prem knew the power of people and relationships, and he pushed all of us to connect with others, cross disciplinary lines, open our minds to new ideas, cooperate and collaborate to achieve higher goals and make change happen. Prem was a true rainmaker. 
He instilled faith and created resources, even when they seemed improbable or impossible to attain. These foundational tenets of research excellence are the backdrop to the Prem S. Paul Research Center at Whittier School. The Whittier School represents bold, visionary work that can change the world. At Whittier, you will find research centers and infrastructure supports that position UNL to shape our future through innovations in diverse areas such as energy production, environmental sustainability, transportation systems and infrastructures, highway safety, big data in the life sciences, evidence-based programs for children, adolescents, and families, rural education, and so much more. Whittier is the operational reflection of Prem's success at establishing a culture and creating capital for us to set lofty goals, to take risks, and to leverage our talents and resources toward big ideas and even bigger impact. Space like this is a true commodity, but it's so much more than bricks and mortar. In many ways, the Whittier School is an embodiment of who Prem was. It represents relationships of people from different perspectives, backgrounds, and vantage points. People who come together to dream, create, and grow. It represents commitment to excellence at all levels, from UNL's top administrative leaders to interdisciplinary researchers and change agents who not only set big goals, but surpass them. By establishing the Whittier Center, Prem made it possible for many of us to achieve beyond expectation and then helped us do even more. As evidenced by this building and the entities that populate it, Prem never accepted mediocrity. He helped us believe in ourselves and each other. Indeed, he helped Nebraska become exceptional. Thank you, Prem, from the very bottom of my heart. We will never forget you. And our last speaker this morning before hearing from the family is the gentleman who brought Prim to Nebraska from that foreign land to the east known as <laughs> Iowa. Our former chancellor, Harvey Perlman, and I think it's safe to say that Harvey was also perhaps Prim's best friend. Please join me in welcoming former chancellor Harvey Perlman. Thank you. Uh, it's my sad honor to be here today to speak at the naming of this remarkable building for a remarkable man, Prim Paul. We feel the emptiness his passing has left, and yet it is, at least for me, impossible to remember Prim, as I often do now, without smiling at the memory of the times we spent together. The list of appropriate adjectives to describe him is endless, Smart, driven, indefatigable, enthusiastic, exuberant, humorous, and humble. Do not come close to exhausting the list. He was for me a colleague, a mentor, confident, and a friend. And so you will pardon me for reminiscing. Small coincidences can have large impacts on an institution. As interim chancellor in the fall of 2000, I initiated the search for vice chancellor for research. As a lifelong law professor, I knew little about sponsored research or what a VC for research actually did or what I should be looking for. But I hoped to have a search at least well underway by the time the next chancellor was selected. <laughs> Subsequently, our high energy physics faculty came to me insisting that I represent UNL at a meeting of the University Research Association in Washington. URA is an association of 89 research universities that establishes and operates unique research facilities like the Fermi National Accelerator. Two days before I left for Washington, the search committee presented me with resumes for four final candidates for vice chancellor for research. I had only the chance to review them quickly before I left. When I arrived at the meeting in Washington, I discovered that only a few actual presidents or chancellors ever attended. <laughs> Most sent delegates. 
The meeting was in a large auditorium in the National Academy's building. I took a seat next to an East Indian fellow. As we made introductions, I realized he was one of the finalists. <laughs> and he realized I was the person that would make the decision. <laughs> After resolving the ethical dilemma of whether we should even speak to each other, <laughs> We spent the day together. So as luck would have it, I had the chance for a full day and evening to get to know Prem Paul. Needless to say, it was an enjoyable and productive day, and I must say more interesting for both of us than the nuances of high energy physics. <laughs> Perhaps as another sign of fate, it was later in the afternoon of that, e that meeting that I received a phone call from the Chancellor's search consultant asking me if I intended to allow my name to be considered for permanent chancellor, an intention I had up to then quite publicly rejected. Later, Prem was to take full credit for my change of mind. <laughs> At the end of the day, I asked Prem if he would accept the position knowing that I was an interim and that thus far expressed doubts about wanting the job. With a mischievous smile, he dismissed the question out of hand, claiming that he knew I would become chancellor. This was my first, but not my last, experience trying to determine whether Prem's confidence was the product of wishful thinking or some residual Eastern mysticism. <laughs> On arrival in Lincoln, he quietly diagnosed the state of our research enterprise. He correctly saw that our talent exceeded our ambition. He systematically set about to dismantle the culture of underperformance. He taught us how to recognize and, more importantly, celebrate excellence and accomplishment. Over the course of his tenure, research expenditures exploded. Our rate of growth exceeded almost every other major research university in the country. Prem was personally a humble and a modest man. While he was certainly proud of his own very significant scientific accomplishments, he did not boast about them. In that way, he fit well with our traditional Midwestern modesty. But Prem was unabashed in bragging about the university, about the accomplishments of individual faculty, about the extraordinary potential he saw and helped us exploit. Indeed, at times, his exuberance made many of us blush with embarrassment. On more than one occasion, I quietly worried about how he would achieve the accomplishments he promised, only to relieved, be relieved when he did so. Prem understood the ultimate goal of a university research was to better the human condition, but he also knew that the university was evaluated on the amount of research funding we received. During his early years, he truly lived by the creed, show me the money. <laughs> he talked to faculty about big grants and big dollars needing big ideas. He would end most speeches to faculty with, go get the money. He followed his own advice. He became a legendary presence in Washington, where, of course, the money is. Senator Ben Nelson always claimed that Prem was better known in Washington than he was. <laughs> and he swore Prem had taken permanent residence on his office couch. For some faculty, his constant focus on dollars started to trouble them. For others, it elevated their ambitions. But for all his jokes and asides about money, I suspect there was no research vice chancellor more committed to research in the humanities and social sciences where the payoffs were much smaller. And he worked hard to have the university succeed, even if research would not get credit. No one worked harder to achieve the large gift from the Carson Foundation than Prem and his staff. I had the opportunity to travel to exotic places with Prem on behalf of the university. On each, each trip, we would have an adventure. Some of you have heard this story before. We visited Zambia to inspect Charles Wood's HIV laboratory and then took a side trip to Botswana to visit the Chobe National Game Park. On entering Zambia, you receive a visa good for your length of stay. We would be in Zambia for 10 days. The penalty for overstaying your visa was imprisonment until a substantial fine is paid. In going through Zambian immigration on the way to Botswana, it was discovered that Prem's visa had expired. Instead of saying 10 days when we, when, we, uh, when we came in, 
We imagined he had said Tuesday, the day of our departure, which was interpreted as two days. Charlie and I were petrified. <laughs> Not, I think, with the prospect of Prem going to jail, but with the prospect of coming home to tell Missy. <laughs> Sorry, Missy, we left Prem in a jail in Zambia. <laughs> We finally managed to negotiate Prem across the border, now with a new visa, with a proper time frame, only to discover that Botswana and immigration required a fee of $25 that had to be paid in Pula, the Botswanian currency. We had none. Prem managed to get a tour bus of European college students to exchange Pula for our Zambian <laughs> Quatsa. Charlie also took us on what was, for each of us, our first visit to China. Susan and I and Prem and Missy subsequently explored many exotic areas in China, including a river cruise on the Yangtze through the Three Gorges Dam. My role on these trips was to climb with Prem to the top of every Buddhist pagoda we happened to come across. <laughs> on these visits, I saw a spiritual side of Prem. He would always light the incense, meditate for a short time, and pay respects to the Buddhist monk. The most important mission on any trip was to find an appropriate gift for Missy. I would come along to offer advice. In a very fancy shop in Pretoria, South Africa, he finally found a display of a particular jewel available only in that region. While he made his decision, we were treated like royalty. We were offered special seating while he examined the merchandise. We were served high tea. However, on making his selection, Prem's credit card was rejected. <laughs> Negotiations with American Express by cell phone were difficult and unproductive. And unbeknownst to us, this extended our stay in the shop past closing time when security procedures were automatically implemented. Iron gates came down covering all means of exit. I think both of us thought that we had just been arrested. <laughs> Fortunately, we had enough cash between us to escape. In India, I had the privilege to meet many of Prem's relatives and friends, and on one trip to travel to Kar Karnal, where he grew up. He was proud of his heritage. He was particularly exuberant, even for Prem, as he showed me the sights, took me to a Hindu temple where he was greeted as an old friend. It was an unusually cold evening as we had dinner at his brother's home. Indian homes are not heated, and my continuous shivering was only stopped by a neighbor who invited us to his house and magically produced a bottle of Jack Daniels. <laughs> Prem was so proud of his family. He was a strong advocate for Missy's paintings, I think more excited about her getting an invitation to a show than about getting research grants. He was the consummate father of the bride at Nita's wedding in New York. He admired Ryan and gushed openly over his granddaughter, Ashlyn. It is in many ways fitting that Whittier now bears Prem's name. The university acquired Whittier in 1983 and it sat largely empty for two decades. Periodically, it housed some offbeat, mysterious research activity, like the Screw Worm Project. If you're not familiar, screwworms are flesh-eating worms that can infect both animals and humans, and putting them in Whittier largely isolated them from the risk of any human contact whatsoever. <laughs> Yet Whittier was a building with significant potential. One had to look past the rac raccoons and skunks and birds that called Whittier home, or the dirt and debris that had over the years accumulated here. The building had solid bones. It was built at the time when construction methods transitioned between solid concrete foundations of massive size and smaller support columns made possible by incorporating reinforcing steel bars. Uncertain about the new system, Whittier was built with both. <laughs> column size for solid concrete, but reinforced with steel. One also had to look past the boarded windows, the decaying sheetrock, the grimy tile to see the glorious window wells that bring light into the building, the woodwork, and other aesthetic features that were waiting to be set free. Prem saw these possibilities just as he saw the possibilities for a university, 
that like Whittier was waiting for its potential to be released. He saw extraordinary faculty who had not been provided the support they needed. He saw other faculties whose ambitions were more modest than their talent. He saw a culture here, like Whittier, was decaying from the glories of its past and failing to achieve its present or future. He embraced the prospect of renovating Whittier as he embraced the prospect of reigniting the university's research effort. Both now stand tall and both are a testament to this unique and engaging man. The Friday before he went into the hospital for the final time, he visited me in my office at the law school. He told me of his intention to resign as vice chancellor in December and then return to the faculty. I think we both knew that plan was overly optimistic. Actually, I believe he came to say goodbye for when we stood, we spontaneously hugged. We thanked each other for our time together, the fun we had together, for the achievements we shared together. We miss you, Prem. If you are observing us, we know you would be smiling, but impatient. <laughs> you would be counting the minutes we're spending here that could be spent toward more research funding. <laughs> His name on this building will serve as a reminder in perpetuity of what, with boldness, grit, enthusiasm, and persistence, he accomplished for the university in the state of Nebraska. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey. Some might call that meeting at the National Academy Divine Intervention. <laughs> and now to represent the Paul family, we're so pleased to welcome to the podium Prim's son, Ryan Paul. Ryan. Good afternoon. Uh, tough act to follow, thank you. So as um, Chancellor Green mentioned, my name's Ryan. I'm here with my family, and you know, we'd really like to thank the university, its Board of Regents, Chancellor Green, um, for this tremendous honor. Uh, it's really cool to you know, see his colleagues and those he's worked with speak so affectionately about him, just as, as we know him at home. You guys got to you know, a piece of that here. And thank you, Harvey, for bringing my father to university um, and helping making this a place that he and our family has called home for over 15 years. <clears throat> can't begin to tell you how proud I am of my father and his accomplishments, especially while here at UNL. And, um, you know, I think, you know, some of, uh, some of those things specifically around the sciences and interdisciplinary uh, initiatives, but also some of the adventures um, that he went on. My father always spoke to me of passion, uh, and this was very important. When I was a few years out of school, uh, I had chased the wrong ideals, ended up in banking, and I wasn't very happy. Um, and he told me to find my passion. Don't worry about the rest, the rest will come. Don't chase money or fame or power. Find what it is that makes you happy and the rest of this will, will kind of come to fruition. And this was sage advice that thus far has led to a happy and fruitful career for me. He always infused my sister and I with his infectious, positive energy and support. Um, that's the same energy he brought every day to the University of Nebraska. Um, and he knew that passion paired with collaboration, both internally, across departments, externally with other universities and with the private sector, would help to fuel the growth that the University of Nebraska was capable of. And the Whittier School here is a perfect example of that vision. As you all know, my father, Dr. Prem S. Paul, always pushed to think big. So as we're here in honor of his accomplishments, we look to UNL's further growth in the future the best way to honor him and to continue to follow his advice is by putting fashion, passion first, fashion second. <laughs> well, it was very important, and, and the poor man was born colorblind, so thank you to Missy Paul for establishing all his outfits. Um, green and green doesn't mean it matches. So, as you look to put your passion first, 
And remember to think big. And I, again, I want to thank you all for being here. This is a very important day for us. And I know um, I, I can't even imagine how proud my dad would be. So thank you. And now, uh, in closing, we want to show you a rendering of uh, if Mike Zeleny will come forward. Uh, first of all, please give Mike and all of our O-Red team a huge round of applause. Now, we have re-signed the building, as you would have seen when you came up the, the drive, uh, with a new sign with a new name. But there will be a bigger sign that will front on to Vine Street uh, to our south here that has been designed by our facilities team that will be in the process of putting in place in 2017. Big year for us, and this will be one of those things that we'll add to that year, and it will look like this to honor Prim Paul. Again, thank you on behalf of the family and of the university for being here today to honor Prim. The sign in the back that is signed by so many of Prim's colleagues says it all, says it well. We love you, Prim. We miss you. We will never forget you. You will always be part of the University of Nebraska. There is no place like Nebraska.